Proverbs chapter 25. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the glory of kings to search out a matter. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the hearts of kings are unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver and material comes out for the refiner. Take away the wicked from the king's presence and his throne will be established in righteousness. Don't exalt yourself in the presence of a king or claim a place among great men. For it is better that it be said to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. Don't be hasty in bringing charges to court. What will you do in the end when your neighbour shames you? Debate your case with your neighbour and don't betray the confidence of another, lest one who hears it put you to shame and your bad reputation never depart. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover to an obedient ear. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to those who send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. As cloud and wind without rain, so is he who boasts of gifts deceptively. By patience a ruler is persuaded, a soft tongue breaks the bone. Have you found honey? Eat as much as is sufficient for you, lest you eat too much and vomit it. Let your foot be seldom in your neighbour's house, lest he be weary of you and hate you. A man who gives false testimony against his neighbour is like a club, a sword or a sharp arrow. Confidence in someone unfaithful in time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a lame foot. As one who takes away a garment in cold weather or vinegar on soda, so is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap coals of fire on his head, and Yahweh will reward you. The north wind produces rain, so a backbiting tongue brings an angry face. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than to share a house with a contentious woman. Like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Like a muddled spring and a polluted well, so is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. It is not good to eat much honey, nor is it honourable to seek one's own honour. Like a city that is broken down and without walls is a man whose spirit is without restraint. Another 28 wonderful proverbs. And um, these proverbs, it says at the start of this chapter, were copied out by King Hezekiah's men. Solomon reigned just after the year, just after the years 1000 BC, like in the years kind of like um, 960, 970, 980 BC, that's when he reigned. King Hezekiah was reigning in the um, 700s-ish. So we've got a couple of hundred years from King Solomon to King Hezekiah. And um, King Hezekiah's men, his public servants clearly, have found some of the writings of Solomon and have copied them out and I think possibly compiles the book of Proverbs together with you know, all the Proverbs of Solomon that, were, that are available and with some Proverbs of a few other wise men which we will meet in chapters 30 and 31. We, we know that Solomon had written 3,000 Proverbs that tells us that in the book of 2 Kings, but in the book of Proverbs we don't even have a third of them. So presumably we've got his best Proverbs, but if it were not for King Hezekiah, we would be missing a few chapters of them, which we have here. In verse two, it says, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing and the glory of kings to search out a matter. It's definitely the glory of kings to search out a matter. So, you know, something's going on in the kingdom, the king needs to find out what's going on. So someone comes before the king and says, this has happened to me or this is happening, the king is now going to start an inquiry. He's going to find out the matter, figure it out and sort it out. That type of thing definitely brings a glory to a king, especially if he does it with justice. But there's another whole way of looking at this as well. In this another whole way of looking at it, God, is, God gets the glory for hiding things and you and I are the kings and we have the glory for discovering them. 
And in one level, this is true. You know, God made this fabulous universe, and the longer we live, the more we discover about it. So it's God's glory we're discovering, but it's exciting and glorious to discover it. But it's also spiritually true. We've got this Bible that's full of so much wonderful uh, truth and knowledge and revelation, and it's God's glory that he's put it all there for us, and it's so glorious for us to discover it all. In verse 7, Solomon said, It is better to be said, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of the prince. Jesus told a parable very similar to this about a wedding feast. So I guess in ancient times they'd have these weddings and they'd put all the chairs in order of, you know, most important to least important. And at weddings today, you know, um, when you go to a wedding, often there's a name tag at the table, so you know where you're supposed to sit. And, um, but imagine if there wasn't. Imagine if you went to a wedding and there was no name tag at the table. <laughs> and you think to yourself, oh, I'm gonna sit at the, the uh, table closest to the bride and the groom. <laughs> But in the mind of the bride and the groom, you know, that table is for their family. So you get to the wedding, or they get to the wedding, and it's like, excuse me, could you please go down there? But by the time they say that to you, you know, all the tables are filled in, so you get the one furthest away from the bride and the groom. But imagine, you know, you're a family member, or someone important, and you choose a table at the back. And, you know, the family come and say, oh, no, no, sit up near us. Well, that's, you know, in front of everyone, very honouring. Well, that is what... Um, Solomon is saying here. In verse 21 and 22, we have a kind of a, a pair of proverbs. If your enemy is hungry, give him food. If, if he is thirsty, give him drink. For you will heap coals of fire on his head and Yahweh will reward you. That was two verses. Paul quotes this pair of verses in Romans chapter 12. And he was talking about, you know, doing good to those who hurt you. You know, feed, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And um, when I, I remember when I was in primary school that we discussed this. I went, to a Christ, I went to Christian education all the way through. Baptist school, grade two, one, two, three. Seventh-day Adventist school, grades four, five, six, seven. Catholic education, um, eight, nine, 10, 11. And homeschooling, grade 12. <laughs> Christian, the grade 12 was also Christian. And, um, you know, going through all these different schools, you know, every school w was good in various ways and we learned lots of things about the Bible. And I remember in, in the Seventh-day Adventist school, we were discussing that Romans chapter 12 passage. You know, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. By doing so, you'll pour coals upon his head. I remembered thinking at the time, ooh, you know, I really want them to suffer. You know, this is what I was thinking. I thought, the reason why we do, the, we do kind deeds to our enemies is so they will suffer even more. <laughs> and um, later on, when I was older, I, th I realized, oh, that's not right. That's, an, that's a very evil way of thinking. <laughs> I was wrongly, I thought about that with an evil heart. And I realized we, what, what actually happens is that we do kind deeds for our enemy, not because we want them to suffer, but because we want to bring them around to Christ. But what happens is sometimes those enemies reject our kind deeds and their heart becomes harder. The result is that they do suffer more. They suffer more now and in hell. In hell, they definitely have, have the hotter, the, a hotter experience, you could say. Coals poured upon their heads in hell. But they have it here now. It's, it's, and in a sense, it's conviction. So, you know, by doing a kind deed for them, conviction is poured upon them. And the conviction, you know, can eat, can bring them to, to repentance and soften them, or it can bring them to hardness of heart. So we do kind deeds for them, not because we want them to suffer, but because we want to bring them to conviction. We want to see them restored, reconciled. So in the end, our goal is actually that our enemies become our friends. So our goal should not be to harm our enemies even more and use this scripture as proof, you know, Romans 12 and Proverbs 25, but rather our goal should be to win our enemies over so that they become our friends. And um, this is definitely the way Christ thinks about it because the Bible says that once upon a time, you and I were his enemies. So what Christ did for us is he gave his life for us. He definitely sought to turn us from enemies into friends. <laughs> so we should be copying his example too. And Solomon here in his wisdom points it out. 
Lord, I thank you for Proverbs 25. I pray that these words would live for us. I pray we would become people who convert our enemies into friends. And right now I pray for people in our lives who are antagonistic towards us. Lord, help us to do kind deeds for them. And if anyone is really struggling with this thought right now, Father, I pray that you would make it clear to them by the grace of God. Amen.